In 2014, it was discovered that Polixeni had inoperable and incurable metastases in her bowel. The prognosis was dire. She was told that she might only last another two weeks. With a clever oncologist and much luck, somehow she survived. So in a very weak condition and with the help of Roy Chu, Polixeni managed to make a body of work that reflected on death itself, which we all believed was about to overcome her. One of the works in Melancholia is especially puzzling. The frail old man representing decrepitude has a smile and a twinkle in his eye. I know that the cheeky grin is in the inanimate mask or the angle that it's seen from, but that doesn't explain why Polixeni chose it and wanted that wicked delight that the clown expresses. All the figures in Melancholia are clowns and it intrigued Polixeni that clowns should have emerged in history for our entertainment with such an inscrutable balance of sadness and joy. They're bizarre figures who seem to embody something about human nature that we don't understand. Among all people who wear a mask, the clown is the most complete because you have no idea who the real clown is, just as you'd never guess that Olympia is inside the costume. This perfection of disguise, maybe at the expense of the internal person, seemed to allegorise death where your unconscious conjectures that there might be something on the other side, but you don't know anything about it. Meanwhile, there is time for mirth. This old man, who's in fact a girl about to start university, represents the decline of life, decrepitude. He has a little giggle. Even in her dire condition, Polixeni didn't want the keynote to be depressing, but a moment of wonder in a parallel, and hence the paradoxical festivity of the unknowable clowns with their velvet and silk patches and plumes and bright flashes or ornament that could have been worn in any epoch from the early modern period. It's sometimes in bad taste to joke about death, but at other times it seems almost necessary. Acknowledging the absurd helps create a perspective with some existential tolerance in it. Death, this great leveller that takes of high and low his rent, as Chaucer says, is something that we have to reconcile ourselves with, sadly and bizarrely. The wise old Chaucerian jester, who is poetically also a young woman, chuckles benignly, contentedly contemplating life, albeit at the end, oh brittle joy, when there came a privy thief, men keep a death. Between the years when Polixeni was making her previous two bodies of work, Olympia discovered an anonymous poem, O Come Dingani, How You Fool Yourself, set to music by Stefano Landi, uh, now known as Passacaglia della Vita. Uh, in fact, it's a grim ballad that describes the futility of medical science, riches, wisdom, hope, philosophy, pharmaceuticals. Nothing helps against death. The refrain, bisogna morire, you have to die, punctuates the verses with bleak constancy, but the macabre glee is also there as the poem celebrates how we die dancing and singing, we die playing on the pipes or the lyre, we die drinking and eating. And the Baroque song is black but infectious, and the music inspired Solomon, our son, to learn it by heart, even though he didn't read uh, Italian. But with Olympia's help and intermediate French, he figured out enough of the meaning to project the sentiment. It echoed for weeks throughout the house. It wouldn't have been a direct influence. Uh, Polixeni was inspired by her own pressing sense of mortality. But the weight of sadness that Melancholia bears was never intended to be totally gloomy. There was always room for the absurd. In making Melancholia, Polixeni returned to the black velvet backdrop that situates the figure in an abstract darkness, a non-space without reference. She used it to great effect in Phantom Wise 12 years earlier. Actually, one example from that 
uh, body of work also took up the theme of the clown and almost uh, that it almost foretold melancholia in a medieval allegorical way. In Winter Clown, the absence of shadows creates a beautiful suspension of the figure in space. You can't momentarily distinguish which foot is in front of the other. It's like a little dance in the eye without movement in the feet. How extraordinarily clown-like. But in Melancholia, the figure is three-quarter sitting on a stool. Maybe Polixeni didn't want the black to dominate, as if a tomb for the clown. She cuts down on the amount of black by using a new format. So just before the diagnosis, Polly had bought a new Nikon camera. For the first time, she was preparing to set aside her square, medium format Hasselblad. And to match Phantomwise, she still could have uh, like uh, created an artwork in square format simply by adding a black strip to either side of the digital file. In fact, she tried that very trick. I remember her looking at each work on her big screen with the extra black added, I guess to preserve her beloved square format. But then she decided against it. Maybe she wanted taller pictures to dignify the uprightness of the clown so the posture didn't look too slumped. But I think that she just didn't want so much black. She didn't want to overwhelm both the figure and the spectator with an inky void. Rather, she wanted the field to bounce back at you with the sparkle of the performer, even if he or she is a bit defeated. The gleam and wink will also perish and slip into sombre shades of nothing. But at this stage, the brightness merrily outlives the gloom. Many colours that accept the black into which they'll pass and wave goodbye. And OK, you still don't know who the clown is, just as death is unknowable. But the encounter seems transcendent and magical rather than dispiriting. Maybe like Chaucer and many poets who followed Polixeni declares that death shall be dead.